All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is another session of uh, Parker Community Office Hours. Uh, we have a code, code of conduct. You can find the link in our uh, document, uh, shared document. Check it out uh, and please be nice to each other. That's the gist of it. Today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a new release of Parker. We have really nice uh, UI improvements. And then we also uh, get an update on uh, Columnar Store. Uh, besides that, if you won't have anything else to discuss, you can just like add to our regular uh, public document and we can discuss. Okay, so for the release, uh, we have a link in the document. You can check it out. But otherwise, uh, if we, uh, do we have any volunteers to talk about the new UI features? I can talk about some of them. <laughs> nice. Go ahead, Monica. Um, so so one one big thing that we introduced uh, with this release was a targets page to the UI. So uh, now in the navigation bar, should I share my screen or yeah, that would be awesome. Hopefully. Hopefully it works. Sometimes it doesn't for me. Do you see uh, Arca? I'm running yeah, it on yeah. localhost right now, but um, this should be enough to, to see the changes. Uh, so basically, this is the, the new page that was added to the navigation bar targets. And when we click into this, I'll just make it a little bigger. When we click into this, we see uh, basically a list of uh, of all of the the jobs that we have. So each job would have uh, its own table of these URL targets. And we have all the information displayed that we need from initial from an initial take. But if we want to expand to see discovered labels, uh, we can also click into each of these rows and see additional information for the target. So uh, we also have the status of the target shown. Right now, it looks like everything's good. Um, but but if there was something wrong, then these would be shown in red. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's basically it. I can preview dark mode as well. But that's awesome. Like what we need is definitely dark mode. <laughs> I said this before, but I really like this uh, ability to, you can just like uh, like show discovered labels and then collapse that. Like mm -hmm. we should have that in Prometheus target page as well. Like if you have time, like you should definitely contribute that back to the mm -hmm. upstream as well. It, that's just like awesome. Thanks, thanks. Glad to hear that. Um, yeah, any questions about this or anything else? If not, then I can hand over to, to Yomi, who might uh, go well, first. One thing, it's just one more compliment. I love how we can finally see also the duration, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is something that previously was so confusing always. We didn't really know how long um, Parker was scraping. This is particularly useful for the like sampling profiles, like the mm -hmm. CPU profile that we were seeing here where the duration is exactly one second, which is the configured duration. But it's it's really awesome to see that difference compared to the other ones. And also that like, let's say the heat profile is not actually, you know, instant. It mm -hmm. actually takes like a hundred um 40 milliseconds uh to produce uh, i i think it's awesome i, I really love everything mm -hmm. that's on this page um, and i think i want to say we also improved the way that we're displaying the numbers is that right compared to like last time when we demoed yes it? yeah that was uh, in addition to make it more like human readable so whenever it's uh basically under one second we would show the milliseconds 
We would show that value as milliseconds. Otherwise, we round to the nearest second. Uh, yeah, based on like human processing of information, uh, it's two seconds ago versus 2.13 seconds ago is um, is hard to visualize. So, so I think that uh, this level of detail matters when it's below one second. If it's below one millisecond, then we just have um, less than one millisecond because that's basically close to nothing. Yeah, I love it. I, 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 I only noticed it because I know last time I noticed that the numbers seemed weird to me and now it was it, it felt very natural. So I lo really love um, how this turned out. Yeah, cool. very nice. I love it. I think in the future, like, I mean, there's always features we can add, but um, I would imagine like sorting by health status would be a big one, just so you don't have to scroll to get to uh, something that's going wrong. Um, and sorting by, by like duration, for example, or or whatnot, or last error. Cool. Cool. Thanks again. Yeah. Yomi, do you want to take it over? Yeah. Yeah. I can. Um, so I will be talking about the new um, table reports that I worked with. I worked on with Matthias and also um, the new day speaker that we worked on, rather Manoj worked on, um, since it's not here, I'll talk about it. So um, I'm guessing everyone can see my screen, right? So the, one of the cool things that we also added in the last release was the you know top table report, which allows us like at a glance, see what particular function is taking up the most um, yeah, cumulative values of flat values. And the cool thing is that, um, one of the cool things is that you can actually get to like see um, a side-by-side -side view. Um, you can also like do a table view only or the icicle graph. And of course you can easily like sort by cumulative, by flat, even by the name. And then um, I think a really cool thing that is like when you merge, like you can actually see like what particular like profiles is taking the most. So I think that's really cool. Um, let me see what else. Oops, what else is new? Yeah, also, yeah, the cool thing, because like, you know, the idea of using um, like shareability, like if you want to share a particular view with someone, um, the cool thing is that if you actually do click on a particular view and you do this, for example, um, on another tab, um, it actually does like sh sh um, preserves the view. So, you know, if I share a view that has a table view to, with um, Kemal, when Kemal opens on his laptop, he's going to see the table view too. So yeah, that's that's the cool thing. Um, and yeah, I think that's all for top table, um, basically. And then for the date speaker, which Manoj actually worked on, we actually have a much better and improved date speaker. Um, you get to do things, we have like a preset values and then you can actually choose whether you want to be able to do in minutes, hours or days and you can actually go in and I, I think, think you're you are, yeah, I, I mean, you're representing. <laughs> yeah, I just realized. Um, so yeah, so the new day speaker that Manoj worked on basically allows us to like, it has like a preset set of values last one hour, last three hours. Um, and then you can also go in, choose whether you want minutes, get in here and type as much as you want, hopefully not so much. Um, and then another cool thing is that there's also like an absolute value if you want to like go back in time, like way back in time. So that's really helpful for people who want to like be able to go to like several months ago and actually choose like a time and whatnot. And it actually does um, update it here. That's not valid, but yeah. That's another cool thing for the day speaker. And um, yeah, um, it works across, like if you do a compare, it's the same thing, which is really cool. And yeah, um, that's that's that on the day speaker um, that Manoj worked on. And another thing that we also worked on, that Monica actually worked on, that I guess maybe she didn't remember to talk about, was that on the graph now, um, whenever you filter with a particular time range, in the past, like for example, last one hour, the graph only showed values from when there was available data, but then we've actually changed it so that it actually does show like, it, it shows the other timestamps 
but you only start from when you actually started, you know, fetching data. So that's cool. I think that was really confusing for people when you do last one hour and the graph like starts at the beginning almost immediately. So I think this is this is um better. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all of the UI things we talk about. One thing the, I, would, yeah. I would just add to the date picker, which I thought was cool. If you go back to that page, if you select a smaller portion of the graph of the data, like click and drag to select yeah. the, it uh, yes. naturally changes to yes. Uh, yes. absolute. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Which I thought was really cool. So. So it gives you like the best of both worlds. You still see like the full three hours, even if there's no data available. But if you just want to zoom in on the on the available data, you can still do that. So I love it. I, I actually didn't notice that, uh, like how it also crops the like it leaves out the date if it's the same date and only shows the the time. That's really time. awesome. Yeah, I, I hadn't noticed that uh, up, and, yeah. uh, up until just now. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love this. I, I absolutely agree. This is really amazing. It's funny how, how excited one can get about a date picker, but like, this is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely very excited about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the previous flow was quite um, limited. Like, you could only select a particular, but this is like really extensive and very comfortable. And it's so pretty. <laughs> it is. Like, it is. I, like every other date picker I know is just like a pain, like just like eye cancer to look at. Mm -hmm. There's so many options and I just yeah. like open it and I get instantly overwhelmed. And I think this is the perfect balance of being able to do everything, but still mm -hmm. feels simple. I really yeah. love it. Cool. Um, I'll stop sharing. Amazing feel. Uh, before you stop sharing, I want to ask a question, if you can yes. share again. Yes. So if you pick a profile and select the uh, view to the board, so to see the board table mm -hmm. view and the icicle graph, yes. So what happens if I select a span here? Do we oh. actually update the top table? So right now there are no like interactions between the table, sorry, the graph and the table itself. Um, but actually, what what would you expect to do if so? Me, for example, me selecting on new skip, which should sort of highlight it here, right? Is that what you're thinking? Or you should so, be the other like, way around. First thing I just, the first thing I expected, first of all, yeah, definitely an interaction, maybe highlighted. Are also like if I select a span, so it's a subtree, right? So I would kind of expect to change the table view to only show the mm. list of the top functions of that span. Okay. That's kind of my intuition. I don't know, maybe it's just the preferences, but like since I'm inspecting and drilling down, right? I would love to see what's going on in the left as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe just not to like deleting the rows, maybe just like as we did highlighting something yes yeah. that was my expectations but that could that like now it's more clear for me okay I, I i do think the the use case is sound though that you describe um but i think this is something that should happen on the back end basically i think what should happen when you click here is we change the query for the data to the back end. And then literally the query that we're querying is the label set that we are querying plus the stack trace up until this point. So that way all, all of this aggregation of, uh, of uh, and selection of data actually happens in the back end and the front end mm -hmm. is purely there to, to visualize it. Uh, mm -hmm. At least that's how, how I've been thinking about it. And the reason for that is that way you can have, you know, I don't know, CLI tools that we build for like CI pipelines or something. And they can compare then they do a query against the API and they just say, give me all of the CPU time that we spend in this function and then do, you know, fail if it's using too much CPU or something in their CI pipeline. At least these are the kinds of use cases that I'm thinking of. And that's why I don't want to do something like this in the UI, but rather in the back end. Um, so that we can kind of, yeah, kind of 
build an ecosystem of tools and not make the UI the only useful thing to interact with this data. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense too. So oh, basically like reusability of, of that like functionality. <clears throat> yeah. But, but I really love the, uh, the aspect that you mentioned earlier, Yomi, about the shareability. I didn't even think about this, but I think you 100% nailed it that when you share the link for this, I should be seeing exactly the same thing you were looking at. And yeah, I think that's perfect. And basically the same thing should be reflected once we do the drill down, right? Yeah. But again, I think that'll come once we reflect it as part of the query, because then once you click here, it'll be reflected in the URL and all, like everything will kind of fall into place. But unfortunately, the backend isn't able to do something like this today. Yeah. We'll get there though. Yeah. Well. All right. Any more questions, suggestions, comments? I, I just just one one <laughs> one side note. I I used to think that I didn't need the side by side view, but once I started using it, it just like made perfect sense. Before I was like, nah, I only look at an <laughs> icicle graph or I only look at a table, but like. It, actually, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you for breaking my. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's actually going to even be more interesting when we add more types of graph. It'll be kind of interesting to see how we represent that because right now we're limiting ourselves to like just two types. So, you know, when we add the core graph, like, it'll be nice to see if this was to stay. So, we'll see. Yeah, I, I was already thinking about this as well, whether we have like two spans and you can select them or something yeah but yeah but what if you want to see all three at once exactly thing? <laughs> yeah like build your own dashboard basically mm, yeah basically it becomes a, yeah you're absolutely right it basically becomes a dashboard builder super cool I, I, all, all amazing features nice 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 all right um i'll stop sharing now so we can continue Cool. Thanks again, uh, Monica and Yomi. This update was super dope. And like, it's really nice to see how uh, Parka UI is progressing. Good job. Cool. On another topic, we're going to talk about backend features and uh, like our cool Neve uh, columnar store. So, Frederick, you can take it away. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because I didn't have enough time to uh, prepare some slides um, because I think a lot of what we do really deserves some visualization. But um, basically, I'll just talk a little bit about the progress of um, where we're at since we last talked about it. Um, so we're basically at the point where we have a functioning, very, very simple version of the storage. Um, and the uh, we even have a, a simple version of like concurrent reads and writes working. Um, there's definitely still more work to be done there, but it does work, which is really awesome. Um, and something that I'm personally working on right now is kind of introducing different kinds of encodings. So, so far, what we did is whenever we did a write and there was a, let's say, just a very simple example, there was a column of a string, we literally just write that string every time. And even if it's the same string, we always write the same string. But um, even in the proposal, we already started talking about things like run length encoding, or actually in the string example, we do a combination of dictionaries and run length encoding. So what that means is what when, when we have the same string uh, that we store multiple times in a row, the first thing we do is, have we seen the string before? And we kind of put it into a map and uh, kind of give each string a number. So let's say we've never seen any strings before and we see our very first string ever. This is string number one, right? And then we write that same string, let's say a hundred times. The only thing we note is that we wrote string number one a hundred times. And that's the only thing we um, store in the storage or at least that's the idea. That's the thing that I'm implementing right now. Um, and Obviously, this is way more efficient than 
storing the same string a hundred times in a row, right? Um, that that means that our memory usage will be lower, but also um, actually cache efficiency is nicer because we never need to exit um, like CPU cache because everything that we're talking about is literally a single string and we're just saying this happens a hundred times. So we never need to even go to main memory to figure out what happens. So this kind of um, even more improves um, the um, query efficiency that we can we can achieve. So that's super cool um, and important, not just cool. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there, there are a couple of, of, of encodings that are important, but the like combination of dictionary and run length encoding is the most important one. And the way that we're actually doing this is um, because we, we're not the first ones to have wanted to do something like this. There's the Apache Parquet format, um, which we talked about a couple of times already that we wanted to start using. And the Parquet format essentially has all of these encodings already implemented. The one thing that is different from the assumptions that Parquet makes compared to um, what we need in the Parca storage is that Parquet has kind of a static schema. So let's say it has column ABC, but we actually need our schema to be kind of dynamic. We need to create a column every time we see a new label name for the very first time. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that I've been building around the Apache Parquet format um, and kind of, yeah, in introducing and using a couple of low level libraries from, uh, from Parquet. Uh, to make this happen. And I, I can actually um, do a very quick demo. It's, 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 it looks very unspectacular because I'm only inserting three rows, but you'll see anyways, um, uh, the, the kind of scheme that I just described. Let's see if I can share my screen. I think I can only share my entire screen, so. I believe you can see my terminal. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Yes. So um, I, I kind of uh, started um, implementing this as a completely new package because really this has nothing to do with concurrency control or the way that things are uh, laid out in the database or anything. Um, this is really just about building buffer, buffers in memory that happen to be in Parquet format. Um, but the really cool thing about representing our in-memory state in Parquet as well means that once we've kind of accumulated all of the data in memory that we want to accumulate, we can literally just take this and write it to disk. No need to rewrite it or anything because Parquet is the kind of persistent format that we want to end up with anyway. So that's a that's a really cool bonus that we're getting because we're using Parquet as the in-memory format as well. So um, let's kind of um, I want to show one of the tests that I have here, um, and the way this works is I have a kind of simple schema um, where we have one column that is a static column, or rather. It is not a dynamic column um, that just, I'm just, I just called it example type. These are just my tests. But the more important one for the Parka example are labels, which as we can see are um, optional. They're a string and they are run length dictionary encoded. And the last thing of magic is they are a dynamic column. And then we have, again, a couple of non-dynamic columns, the timestamp and the value, which um, are just you know, at what time the value was recorded and what value it actually is. And then we also specify which of these columns um, our data is going to be sorted by. Because in, in order for our um, searches to be fast, um, we need the data to be, to be sorted so that we can jump to certain positions in our database to only read the data that we're truly interested in. So uh, we've got the schema um, and we have a couple of uh, test samples. Um, and I'm not going to show the, the way that we kind of transform the Go struct into Parquet data. That's 
um, I'm going to leave that exercise up um, to the viewer. It's basically just kind of a, a simple conversion method. Um, people can look at the repo. But the point is um, we, we can take all of this data um, that themselves, they have different schemas, right? Because the di dynamic part is that we're seeing these label names for the very first time. We're seeing namespace, we're seeing pod, we're seeing container, here we're seeing namespace again, uh, and an entirely different set of labels nodes here. So in this case, let me um, let me show you when we when we actually run this test, right? We now have our Parquet files, and I'm gonna just use uh, some standard Parquet tools um, to inspect this. So ho hopefully that also means that we're writing data actually in correct Parquet specification. If we can use some random other tools that people will put onto the internet, right? And what we can see here now, after all of this data was merged into one, we can see the final schema is we have example type, we have uh, the container label, we have the namespace label, we have the node label and the pod label. All of the columns that we have seen in aggregate over all of our data. And so if we then actually print this data, we can see, okay, our first one, our first uh, piece of data had the namespace label, the pod label, and with these values, as well as all of the other data. So we're, we're actually successfully writing um, data in the Parquet format, so very uh, efficiently, um, and we're accumulating it um, in memory. And we can actually, as we, can, as we just saw, we can actually already write it out to disk. And that was completely for free because we were using the Parquet format in memory as well. So we're just using what we have in memory and flushing it to this. So yeah, that's uh, kind of where we're at. Uh, this, this part of it now needs to actually be integrated back into um, our um, existing code base of the, of the column store. This was kind of built separately and intentionally as a separate package because it really doesn't have anything to do with all of the other stuff. This is kind of purely handling data. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the, the point where we're at. I think, I wanna say, I think it's gonna take us another maybe week or two um, until the column store is, is, is in, a, in a space where people can actually start to, to use it and try it out. And um, yeah, hopefully it'll be as good as we imagine it to be. All of the uh, kind of tests and benchmarks that we're doing all look super promising, but at the end of the day, it'll only truly show when it's really integrated and people, people start using it. The cool thing about all of this is one of the things that we just saw and that we just talked about is that we would want to be able to filter by stack traces, right? Or by subsets of stack traces. And this is, all of what we're doing here is going to enable us to do something like this because one of the columns, I didn't have it in my example data, but one of the columns that we have represent literally the stack trace, right? So the um, IDs of the locations that we're seeing in the flame graph, for example. And so um, what we're gonna be able to start doing is we can build queries that say, does the line, the row in our database, does it contain the subset of locations um, in this sp specific order even? And that way we'll be able to uh, kind of um, communicate to the database that we're looking for a, a, a specific um, stack trace or a set of stack traces that all have a particular sub stack trace in common. So TLDR, I think we're gonna be able to um, do the types of queries that we talked about earlier in the back end as opposed to the front end. So just one question. So the last thing that you mentioned, so if we're able to query that type of data, that means I can just select a function name and see the progress that it's like taking time over like 
over the weeks, right? So I can say, okay, it was, uh, or between versions, we can say, right? So it was taking this amount of time, and now that it's taking this amount of time, we can just like see that, right? Absolutely. Like we, we can even do this on the like graph, right? We can see it in aggregate, how much was this function using in aggregate over different kinds of versions. Like there, there are tons of use cases that we, we could do with this, right? It's, it's not limited to flame graph. That's just so amazing. I guess I, I can easily see that the value that it can just like offer to us, right? To our users. That's amazing. Great. Any other questions or any comments on the columnar store? Okay, cool. Just to know, it's also, we don't have any agenda, it, agenda items right now and the board is open if you have any ad hoc questions or discussion points. No, nope. that's perfectly fine. You can always find us on Twitter, Discord, or any other mediums. If you have uh, any questions, you just can check parka.dev we have all the communication channels available. Uh, we are definitely super easy to find. Otherwise, uh, we will have another office hours in two weeks. Uh, our document, uh, public comment, our document is open. If you have any uh, discussion points at any uh, point of time, just like put it, put it in there and come say hi to this office hours. That being said, yes. Uh, that's it for this week, everyone. Thanks for attending and see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.